So last night, uh, there were a bunch of us here uh, decorating and preparing gifts and just doing all the things that we're doing. And as I headed home, I was driving on 167 on the freeway, southbound. It's dark, and uh, I, I'm just going, I'm in the center lane, I'm just o- obeying the rules, just being a good guy, and all of a sudden, this car just comes flaming up behind me, and so I immediately put on my blinker to, to get out of his way, and get, I noticed I said his, get out of his way, and move into the right lane, and he darted over the right lane, he was going to go around me, but I had already started moving, and so at the last second, he, he went back, he was going to do a slingshot, that's what our son calls it, the slingshot, where you go around in the slow lane because you want to go faster than everybody. And then another car came whizzing up behind him. It almost seemed like they were in a competition with each other. And I don't know about you, I am seeing this where it used to be sort of a rare thing. I see this every time I'm on a freeway now. Every time. People feel, it just seems like they are so anxious that they are, are so stressed out or whatever, whatever is causing them to do this, and that it's, it's almost a, a little bit dangerous for the others on the road. I just sort of want to stay out of their way a little bit. And I'm not an overly cautious driver, but like it's, it's concerning to me. Like, wow, the, people are just raging out there. There is no peace. There's no peace. They don't have peace in their hearts. We're in a Sunday morning series called Renew, Raised to New Life with Christ. And we're talking about the fact that we don't live like we used to live. We don't even live like necessarily the rest of the world lives because we are following Jesus and the Bible says we have been, when, when, we have, uh, when we have confessed our sins and repented and we've been baptized and we come up out of those waters, we are raised to new life with Jesus Christ. We actually participate with him in his death and resurrection. Our life is new. We're changed. And so we're focusing in this series on those ways that we want to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and be changed, be transformed on the inside of our lives and on the outside of our lives also. We've discussed how this is a lifelong process. Even though you, you and I, many of us, we have put our faith in Jesus, it's not over. The transformation's not over. In, in some ways, it's just begun as we learn to walk with Jesus and follow him. We talked about uh, in, in previous Sundays how some, some, in some areas, we need to strip off those sins, those habits, those things that are obstacles in our relationship with God, we need to strip those off almost like a dirty coat after a work day. We need to strip those off. And we need to put on other things, uh, things that are, go along with, with following Jesus and living his life. We've been talking about that over these past few Sundays. Today, I want to invite you to turn to Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3, if you've got a, uh, if, uh, the Bible on your device, or on your, uh, if you have a Bible in your hand, get it open, get God's Word open, crack it open, see what it's got to say to your lives today. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, and we usually put that verse up on the screen so you can see how it's spelled. Go to the table of contents. That, that's about the best way if you're not sure where Colossians is. And today, I want to talk to you about peace. I want to talk to you about peace. Colossians 3.15 says, and let the peace, and let the peace, and let the peace. So there's a certain amount that's on us. We need to do the letting. We need to allow the peace. This this word here, peace, the sense is that it is tranquility. It's the absence of stress or anxiety. You need to allow tranquility, the next phrase, that comes from Christ. And let the peace allow the tranquility that comes from Christ. One of the, the, the coolest passages about Jesus, predicting that he was going to be coming someday, says that he is the Prince of Peace. Yeah. 
Prince of Peace. So peace does not necessarily come by striving, by white knuckling, by even by meditation on anything else but God. Peace comes from the Prince of Peace. You meditate on his word, peace comes. You sit in his presence, peace comes. And let the peace that comes from Christ. And there's another sense of when that of in Jesus' title, the Prince of Peace, that peace is talking about harmonious relationships and freedom from disputes. There's different facets of the peace that Jesus brings. He brings inner peace, tranquility in the midst of a storm. He also brings peace between you and the people in your family, the people you work with, the people around you. He brings peace. So, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. So there's a bunch of stuff. It's just that in a few words, we've already seen we need to allow, we need to do some letting. We've learned that the peace or tranquility comes from Jesus. It comes from Christ. And then we are commanded to let that peace rule in your hearts. Wow. So Jesus puts peace in your heart. He changes you. You have peace with God. You're not at odds with God anymore. But Jesus intends for that peace to rule in your heart. And I, I have always read this as rule as in be the, be the king, like a king rules. And that, that's true. But the sense is that he intends his peace to be your umpire, to be your inner umpire, saying, no, 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 that's out. <laughs> no, that, that's in. That's safe. No, nope, that's foul. And there is something about the peace of Jesus ruling in your heart that he wants to affect all of your decisions with peace. Look, looking at it the other way, flipping that upside down, his peace is the filter through which you make your decisions. So sometimes when we're contemplating uh, which way to go, what, uh, what job to take, where to move, what to do, we, we let his inner peace, the peace that comes from Christ, make that decision. We go where yeah. his peace is. We take the move where his peace is. In another way, when we're trying to decide how to act towards someone around us, when we're trying to say, decide what to say to somebody, when we're trying to decide what to do to somebody or with somebody, we let his peace be the decision maker. So sometimes we say, I want to say this, but that would not promote peace. So instead, I'm going to let that peace be an umpire in my life and say, no, 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 that's out of bounds. For as members of one body, continuing in Colossians 3.15, for as members of one body, you are called. Someone say, I'm called. I'm called. Someone say, we're called, we're called to live in peace. That's our calling. You and I, as followers of Jesus, we are called to live in peace. Just take that in a minute. And then he wraps it up by saying, and always be thankful. Always be thankful. You might feel like at times you don't have anything to be thankful for, but listen, we can all be thankful for this good news, that Jesus paid the price for your peace. He paid the price for your peace with God and for your peace with others. He paid the price with his life so you can have the peace you need. So when you run into a difficult situation with a coworker or a classmate, if you're a student, he gives you peace. When you're at odds with your spouse, he gives you peace. When your kids are driving you crazy, whether your kids are two and three or 30 and 35, <laughs> when your kids are driving you crazy, why are they making that decision? And you don't know what to say or do. Choose words. Choose actions that promote peace. The peace that Jesus has put in you 
promote that, pursue that for others, for, for your relationships. So let the pursuit of peace call the shots and set the tone of your renewed life in Jesus. Let the pursuit of peace, the pursuit, let the pursuit of peace in your relationships with God call the shots and set the tone of your renewed life in Jesus. So pursue peace in every decision you make. If you're in the middle of a conflict, push pause to pursue peace. I got four Ps in there. Push pause to pursue peace. If you're in a conflict, that is the time that, uh, that, that should be a red flag to you. Okay, I am probably not leaning on the peace of Jesus on the inside right now. I need to stop, connect with him. Remember, he's given us all the peace I need for the middle of this conflict right now. And then choose words and actions that promote peace. You have all the peace that you need from Jesus. You can operate in peace. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule or umpire in your hearts. So let me ask you this. What are you letting rule in your heart? What are you allowing to call the shots in your life? What are you allowing to prompt your words and prompt your actions? Why not peace instead? <laughs> Colossians 3.17 is a verse I read a little bit earlier in the service. And whatever you do or say, in other words, in your day-to-day -day life, not just when you're in church gathering and it's easy, but whatever you do or say in your bedroom, in your kitchen, at your work, in your school, wherever you go, Whatever you do or say, do it all, every bit of it, as representatives of the Lord Jesus. Many translations of this phrase say, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, wouldn't it change your choices if you were doing every choice? I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. I'm choosing this outfit in the name of Jesus. I'm, I'm choosing this job in the name of Jesus. I'm, I'm going to speak to someone in the name of Jesus. I'm going to uh, do this po social media post in the name of Jesus. Wouldn't that change it if you did everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father? That's what a renewed life looks like. Wow. Live your whole life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, let him lead. If he's going to lead, then that is going to mean, FYI, spoiler alert for you and for me big time, we're going to make some different choices than we usually would if we are doing it in the name of Jesus. Some of the early Christians would make the sign of the cross every time they did anything all day long. They, they were just thinking, this is for Jesus. This conversation is for Jesus. I'm going to work. It's for Jesus. Wow. I, I, we, we've, we've, come, we've come a ways from there, so I'm calling myself back. I'm calling us back as a church to live our lives in the name of Jesus and let his peace reign in our lives. So what, what would it take to have peace in your closest relational circles? So we're going we're to look at three specific ones, marriage, family, and business. So first of all, let's look at what peace between husbands and wives. I know not everyone's married, so just bear with me for a moment. Peace between husbands and wives. Colossians 3 Verses 18 to 19 says, wives, submit. Wives, submit to your husbands. <laughs> Is that okay if I say that, sweetie? Okay. <laughs> wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Now, everyone does a freak out dance when we read this verse, unless you really understand what is going on here. So first of all, he puts a qualifier in this submission, as is fitting, as is appropriate for those who belong to the Lord. 
So it's easy to look at this and go, oh, submitting is what's appropriate. No, he's not saying that. He's saying you submit in ways and about things that are appropriate and fitting for people who follow the Lord together. So in other words, uh, we don't do harmful things. We don't submit in things that are inconsistent with Christian living. That, those are not areas to submit, all right? Uh, so we uh, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. And then husbands get one too. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. That's pretty intense language. Husbands, love your wives, and that is agape love. It is a love of commitment, a love of covenant, a love of uh, sacrifice, a love of affection. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. So this command to the husbands defines the command to the wives. So we're talking about wives submitting to a husband who loves them sacrificially and never treats them harshly. That's the context for the submission. So as the husband pours out his love, he lays down his life, he treats his wife with tenderness, the wife then serves her husband with humility and grace. You see how, what a nice, uh, a nice circle that forms then? So the basis for submission here. And in, there's a parallel passage where Paul talks about this even more in, in Ephesians chapter 5. The, the, the emphasis is the wife's choice to order her life toward her husband. She's making a choice out of her reverence for God. And it is not, the basis for that submission here is not the husband's authority. That's not what Paul appeals to here or in Ephesians 5 where he talks about it even more. So he's not saying because the husband is the head cheese, the wife has to do whatever he says and just be a servant, slave, and doormat. That is not what he's saying. In fact, in in the passage in Ephesians 5, he starts the whole talk about marriage by saying, everyone submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So there is a mutual submission going on. But Paul is no dummy. He knew the wives would have a little bit more trouble with submitting. So he just reminds them, hey girls, okay, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. And he knew the husbands were going to have a little bit more trouble sacrificially, sacrificially loving their wives because husbands can tend to be a little bit self-centered. And he knew that husbands can be a little harsh. And so he reminded us, guys, hey, guys, come on. I know this is going to be hard for you, but the way this mutual submission looks is, husbands, you got to lay down your lives for your wife and never treat them harshly. A husband who loves like this doesn't make demands doesn't overpower his wife, does not beat her down. Instead, he encourages her. He empowers her. He frees her up. That is letting the peace of Christ rule in your life and doing everything as a representative of Jesus Christ. A second realm of life, peace between parents and kids. How many of you are a child of someone? How many are not sure? Okay. Trust me, everyone here is a child of someone. You, you just might be an older child or a younger child. Everyone here is a kid, all right? So there's something here for everybody. And many of you are also parents. Not everybody is, but many of you are parents. Colossians 3.20, 21, talking about this renewed life in Jesus, says, children always obey your parents for this pleases the lord always o- children always obey your parents for this pleases the lord and the obedience is in the context of christian parents living all of life as a representative of the lord jesus that is the context for this always 
obedience. Parents loving Jesus. Parents becoming more and more like him. Parents loving their kids. Parents disciplining while pursuing peace. That is the context for this command. And once again, the child is not bound to obey in anything that would be inconsistent with Christian living. So, for example, a parent says, no longer, you are not allowed to pray to Jesus anymore. Kid says, I must pray to Jesus. That is right. That, that's, what, that's what I mean. That is, an, that is a time when you would disobey. If anyone says you cannot pray, that's something we, let's, we disobey that. We are going to pray. We're going to talk to Jesus. We're going to worship him and him alone. So the, the, the parallel commandment, verse 21, boy, he got the dads again. <laughs> Fathers, do not aggravate your children. Do not aggravate your children for they will become discouraged. He didn't need to remind the moms on that one. He needed to remind the dads. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they'll become discouraged. So the dad's not about intimidating the child with his authority. That's not what it looks to be a renewed life dad. But uh, this kind of dad nurtures his children. He does discipline them in love and for their own good. He sets boundaries, he provides for them, but he does not intimidate them. So Paul is instructing dads to raise your kids, raise my kids in such a way that the child would not want to rebel against God or against the parents. Uh, Author N.T. Wright said, I love this quote, the parent's duty is, in effect, to live out the gospel to the child. That is, to assure their children that they are loved and accepted and valued for who they are. Not for who they ought to be, not for who they should have been, not for who they might, if they would only try a little harder, become. Obedience must never be the condition of parental love. This is is very clarifying. Parents are called to live out the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus says, I am going to forgive you, include you in my family, make you new, revive you, not based on what you you do, not based on your performance, but based on his grace. He loves you. He accepts you. He forgives you. That's the gospel. Parents, live out that gospel with your kids. Don't withhold your love for them because they get a C on a report card, right? You still love them. You may introduce some discipline and some self-discipline and some things like that, but your love as a parent is not to be conditional because our Heavenly Father's love for you and me is unconditional. That is good right there. That is good. Last area, peace in business relationships. Peace in the business of life. So now, Paul here uses a weird illustration of business. And he chooses this relationship between slaves and masters. Kind of interesting. I want to make this very clear. He is not condoning slavery. What he is doing is commenting on something that was happening in his day. Uh, the, the Romans, uh, who were kind of in charge, it was the Roman Empire at this time, they would take slaves. And that may or may not have looked like uh, slavery in, like in the last couple of hundred years in America. But even if it looked different, slavery is taking away someone's freedom. It is owning a person who is actually owned by God. Uh, slavery is wrong. So Paul is not condoning slavery. Uh, he, but this, this is what he says. Colossians 3, 22 says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. So through the, these past few verses, he's been saying to us, here is how you live life as a representative of Jesus Christ. Here is how you let the peace of Christ rule in your heart 
and in your relationships. Here's how. And he's kind of come, come at each one of us in our areas where we're tempted, and by default, we're, we're going to be harsh with our wives, or we're not going to obey our parents. He's coming to each one, and he's saying, hey, listen, here's how you live that life of peace following Jesus. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Seek to please them, whether they're watching or not, because you fear and respect the Lord. That's why. It's because you fear and respect the Lord that it affects your relationships. And in this, uh, in this uh, passage, I'm not taking the time to read all these verses here, uh, 22 to 25. There, he introduces the, a, a, a Christian work ethic, for, for lack of a better title. Work willingly, doing your best, as though you are working for the Lord, not your boss. Today... There, is, uh, there, there are all kinds of weird shifts that have taken place in the workplace. And one of them, the, the name just slipped my mind, but it's something like a quiet resignation or something like that. It's where you show up to work all day and you just don't feel like doing anything. You don't give them your best. You just try to make yourself look busy and you just don't do anything because your heart's not in it. You don't want it. That is not the way it is when you're following Jesus. We show up. We're faithful. We do our best. We work hard because we, we approach that job as if we are working for the Lord Jesus himself because all authority comes from Jesus. Remember that the Lord holds your ultimate rewards and punishment. Then Colossians 4.1, this was absolutely countercultural that Paul would say this. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also are a slave. You have a master in heaven, Jesus. Wow. So Paul gets in here and he, he, he's just saying, hey, the renewed life in Jesus looks different than the average life. It is very possible that the reason Paul took, uh, he actually takes like, I, I think it's five verses or so to talk about masters and slaves in the parallel passage where he talks about these same things in Ephesians chapter 5, he doesn't do that. He just sort of skips by. And the thought is that here, Paul is, is trying to, he's, he's got in mind that he sees, he knows two people whose relationship is not honoring the Lord. And he was trying to convince a Christian master named Philemon to embrace his runaway slave, Onesimus as a Christian brother. They're both Christians. And Paul was saying, hey, your relationship has to change. Even if you continue to work together, you still have to embrace each other as Christian brothers. And it's interesting, Onesimus, this slave, was, we find out from Colossians 4, 8, 9, he was one of the letter carriers who carried Colossians from Paul to the city of Colossae. So, so Paul, he's about to hand this letter off to Onesimus, the slave, and, and, he, and he, uh, he is thinking about this, our relationships in the renewed life. It's also probable that Onesimus carried Paul's letter to Philemon, his own owner, at the same time. So I see some principles of renewed life in these passages, renewed life in Jesus. The first one is this, Jesus wants to be Lord over all your life, all of your relationships. Jesus is Lord. That is very hard for the American church that I'm preaching to today, myself included, I'm in it. We don't want anyone to call the shots in our lives. We want to be independent. And in the United States, Washington, northwest corner, is one of the most independent states. We have a very independent mentality. But we're talking about a renewed life in the kingdom of God. And it looks a little different than the world. We actually surrender and submit to Jesus' leadership. Jesus wants to be Lord over everything. You can make him your savior when you say, please forgive me of my sins and make me new. But don't forget this, and be my Lord. I surrender my choice of finances to you. I surrender my, where I live to you. I surrender my work to you. I surrender how I treat my wife and kids to you. I surrender all that, and you are Lord, and I'm going to follow you and do it your way. 
That's what the Christian life looks like. Would you stop just a minute and examine your life right now? Does your life look like that? Do you say you're a Christian? Is Jesus your Lord? Is he Lord of all? Is he Lord of every decision that you make? Good. That's good. It'll sink in there. If you're in a position of honor or power, God gave you that honor and power so that you could turn it around and lift up the people around you. If you're a boss or a parent or a teacher or whatever, if you have a position of honor and, and power, it's given to you so you can lift up others, encourage them, empower them. If you're in what's considered a lower position or you consider yourself in a lower position of honor or power, God gave you that position so you would be able to serve others in it. Jesus, the Lord of all, came as the servant of all. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. If both people in a relationship would just simply focus on pursuing peace in the relationship, there would be a lot fewer power struggles. If both people in a relationship, work relationship, family relationship, marriage relationship, if both people would be pursuing the peace of Christ, in other words, acting in line with the peace that he puts in mind, inside of you, and also acting out according to what would produce peace in others. If everyone would just do that, it would change our relationships. Imagine if every Christian went the extra mile to pursue peace with others. Your marriages and families would be a life-giving oasis in a desert of chaos. You would feel supported. You would feel encouraged and empowered through life-giving words. Fights would fizzle quickly. If everyone was just pursuing peace, fights would just fizzle out because you would just have this aha moment. Hey, what, what, what am I fighting about? I'm not pursuing peace right now. There would be a lot more questions asked and a lot fewer declarations made. We would be a lighthouse of unity in a sea of division if we would just all pursue the peace of Christ. So just do it. Just that easy, right? No. None of us is able to pursue peace, especially 100% of the time. None of us is able to do that on our own. We naturally react. We act out if we feel disrespected. Man, we're going to let you know. No one takes advantage of me like that. We often let our guard down with those, especially in our inner circles. Sometimes we pursue peace out there, but not with our wife, not with our kids, not with our family. Help us, Lord, is right. Galatians 5.22 the 23 says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. So we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in mine. And when he works in us, this is what comes out. This is what he produces. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wow, that's what the renewed life in Jesus Christ looks like. And Jesus lived this way. He exhibited those fruits of the Spirit in his life. Jesus died to take the punishment for your sins and mine for the times we have not acted like that, like what I just read. He came to take the punishment for that. And when you rely on the peace of that comes from Jesus Christ and the peace that the Holy Spirit produces in you, you got this. You can, you, can, you can walk through a crazy, anxious life with peace on the inside. You can walk into conflict with peace on the inside and peace coming out your mouth because of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in you. Would you stand to your feet? And I would love to just pray for you and pray over you uh, online, would you pray with us too? And you don't have to close your eyes to pray, but sometimes it is helpful just to close your eyes and just sort of shut everything else out when you pray. 
I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray that you would renew our lives. Lord, may we walk in fellowship with you. May we walk in your peace. May we speak and act in your peace, Lord. Renew our lives. Renew our minds. Renew our spirits, Lord. Transform us, Lord. Transform us from the inside out, Lord. Transform us. Make us new. Make us new. With your head still bowed, I just want to ask you, is Jesus' peace ruling in your heart? Is Jesus' peace calling the shots in your decisions? Is Jesus' peace your umpire? Are you living up to your calling to live at peace with everyone? Are you always thankful? If you'd like prayer, would you raise your hand? I would. <laughs> when, I, when I measure my life by others, I think, I'm doing great. When I measure it by God's word, I think, oh, I've got a ways to go. <laughs> so, Lord, you see our hands raised. And, Lord, we're just confessing. We, we know we're, we're, we've not fully lived up to our calling of peace. And so, Lord, we're just asking you right now, in this Christmas season, we're asking for the peace of Christ to actually rule in our hearts. Rule in my heart, Lord. Rule in our hearts. Lord, uh, may your peace guide our decisions. May your peace guide our words. May your peace guide our social media posts. Your peace, your peace, your peace. May your peace be the governor. May your peace be the ruler in our hearts and in our minds, Lord. And Lord, as we are, are really entering into the Christmas season, it's the most joyous season, but it also has its pain. It has its um, exhaustion. It, it has this season, the way we've made it, it has a lot going on. And I just pray, Lord, that we would walk as people of peace every st step along the way. Lord, that we would walk as people of peace and that people would notice that and that your peace would be attractive to others, Lord. With your heads still bowed, I just want to invite you, if you have not given your life to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus to save you. How do you do that? Turn away from your sins, turn your life over to Jesus, and guess what? Let him lead. Make him your Lord. If today you want to do that, you're ready to make that decision, maybe you're coming back to Jesus after, after kind of walking away from him, or maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus before, and today you want to put your faith in Jesus, invite him in as the Prince of Peace, would you just raise your hand? And that will tell me, Pastor, I'm making a decision today. I see, I see you guys raising your hands. That is awesome. Praise the Lord. Anybody else would say, yes, I'm, I'm making that decision today to put my faith in Jesus. How about you online? Would you raise your hand to God if you're making that decision? So let me just coach you in a prayer. And the answer to this prayer is always going to be yes from the Lord. Yes. So let's just join together. and just I'm just going to coach you out loud. Would you just repeat after me and say this to Jesus? Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin, and make me new. I choose to follow you and let you lead. I'll be your apprentice, starting now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. That is amazing. And I can tell you this, when you pray that prayer, uh, uh, sincerely, like you just prayed with faith to Jesus, he says, yes. He says, yes. So Jesus says to you right now, you are forgiven. Woo! Jesus says to you right now, you are new. Jesus says to you right now, I have just put my peace inside your life. Let my peace rule now. Let my peace rule now. So Jesus says to you today, we want to put some, some resources in your hand. If you are starting a, a, a journey with Jesus right now, we've got, we've got some great um, uh, resources for you. Uh, we'll, we'll tell them about that. Help them follow Jesus. Yes. So we have a small booklet. It's called Following Jesus, and there is an accompanying short video, and it's like seven weeks or seven, seven sessions, and they're just like 10-minute long but they will help you get some building blocks 
to live the life of following Jesus and get you in a place where you're reading God's word and understand what that's about and praying and and being in church. So I really want to encourage you to stop by the Following Jesus booth out in the lobby. You'll see a big, huge black sign uh, with the white lettering there, Following Jesus. Um, The one thing that just stood out to me as we leave this place today, push pause to pursue peace. So when you are feeling not very peaceful, just stop. Ask God, Lord, what do you want to do in me? How would you like to see me uh, just interact in this situation and allow his peace to work in you and through you? Amen? Amen. Well, we are going to uh, re-change this room here to make it into a wrapping station. So um, if you have some time to help us, we're going to stack all the chairs um, in, like, I think, you know, it'd be good is maybe to keep them in their rows and just put them on either side of the room. And then we've got some tables that'll be coming in here. So if you have time to do that, that would be awesome. And we would love to see you tonight. If not tonight, next week, have a fantastic week. We love you. God bless.